Welcome to the 23rd session of our New Testament series. In the name of the Father, <clears throat> of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> we continue with the Gospel of John. And again, as I've mentioned, the Gospel of John, it gives us an insight into Jesus, the divine image of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell us what it was like when Jesus was human, what he had to go through. But now we have a divine image of Jesus in John's Gospel. And so he's talking as though Jesus throughout his whole life was totally aware that he was God. And it's teaching us messages about the second person of the Trinity. So we have to approach it that way. Jesus is saying, I'm God. Let me tell you about myself. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is talking to his disciples, but they're learning gradually. And so Jesus himself has emptied himself of many of his God powers in order to be like us, to experience what we experience. And so John's gospel is very different. It's a theological gospel in the deepest sense of the word. Last week, we talked about chapter seven. In chapter seven, it ended with everybody saying, well, we know where you're from. We don't know where the Messiah is supposed to be from. And secondly, you weren't born in the city of David. The reality is Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. The Messiah was supposed to be born in the city of David. Matthew and Luke tell us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But up until this point in the Gospels, as far as other people go, they know him as Jesus of Nazareth. And so they believe he was born in Nazareth. But the reality is he was born in Bethlehem and then moved or went back to Nazareth. And so they really don't know that he was born in the city of David. And also he tells them, where I come from, you don't know. He's saying he's coming from God. He uses the image when he speaks of a parental image of God. Use the image of, the, of God the Father. He's God the Son. It was a type and a way of life in those days when they spoke mainly through male images. So the father, son. And so he's a spirit. But the way they spoke about Jesus in the scriptures and Jesus' uh, relationship to God, the father. So now what happens is we've he's just finished talking to everybody about, you don't know where I came from. And then suddenly there's kind of an interruption. We begin with chapter 8. And chapter 8 tells a story of a woman caught in adultery. And it has really nothing to do with the previous section. This section seems to be something that was put in later on. It really doesn't even sound like John in the original. So what happens is it's somewhere, look closer to Luke, but someone put it in here, copyist maybe, or whatever, they're not sure, but it is inspired. And so it's a little it's excerpt in a sense, kind of a pause in the midst of Jesus' message. And yet there's another message to it. And the message is a woman is caught into adultery and she, they, she's brought before Jesus and she's accused of being caught right in the middle of adultery and therefore should be stoned to death by the law of Moses. And so now they come before Jesus and they're saying to Jesus, what do you think? She should be stoned to death. The woman had to stand there in the midst of them. And Jesus bends down. He starts to write on the ground. And people very often read that and say, well, I wonder what he was writing. It doesn't matter. In fact, it comes from possibly an Old Testament prophecy that simply speaks about God writing on the ground, saying nothing really. And so it doesn't matter what Jesus was writing. He probably wasn't writing anything, probably kind of a distractive mode, doodling or something. But then 
they continue to press him. And Jesus stands up and Jesus looks at the crowd and says, let the one without sin be the first to cast a stone. Back in Jesus' day, the one who brought an accusation against someone, an accusation of adultery, that would be the first person to throw the stone and to stone the woman to death. The others would follow. In this case, it seems like they're all ready to throw the stone. All of them are prepared. And so Jesus says, let the one without sin be the first to throw a stone. And one by one, they begin to drift away. The Pharisees and the scribes brought this woman to Jesus. What they wanted to do was to trap Jesus. Moses' law says if a woman is caught in adultery, she is to be stoned to death. And so they had this woman there and they're saying to Jesus, what's your judgment here? Should we stone her to death as Moses told us? Or should we follow what you've been teaching about forgiveness, love, compassion? And so they think they have Jesus in a bind. And also they want something to get to take against Jesus. They want to charge him with something. They suspect if he stays faithful to his own teaching, that he's going to have to go against the law of Moses. So Jesus then by saying, let the well, one without sin among you be the first to throw a stone. One by one, they drift away. Because they can't look bad before the crowd. Jesus recognized their trap. And Jesus now simply worked with it and said, okay, let, let the one who is sinless among you throw that first stone. And of course, they couldn't admit to the crowd that I am sinless. So they just, one by one, left Jesus with the woman. And then Jesus says to the woman, does no one condemn you? And she says, no one, Lord. And Jesus says to her, then neither will I condemn you. Sometimes we miss the message here. Jesus is a forgiving Jesus. The idea of forgiveness, forgiveness is total. If God forgives us, it's a total forgiveness. And so what happens is that he simply says to go and sin no more. He doesn't say go out and do this or that for a heavy penance. He's simply saying go and sin no more, which is a type of penance for her. Because she has to change her way of life. Go and sin no more. And basically Jesus says that to us. We're all sinners. And whenever we repent of our sins, the big thing for us is to go and sin no more. To change, to be a changed person. And basically, that's a kind of repentance. And so he's simply saying to the woman, go and sin no more. Then Jesus speaks to them again. Now he begins to get into some theological statements about himself some deep theological statements. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisee said to him, you testify on your own behalf. So your testimony cannot be verified. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I do testify on my own behalf, my testimony can be verified because I know where I come from and I know where I am going. But you do not know where I am going or where I come from. You judge by appearances. But I do not judge anyone. Again, going back to the woman taking an adultery. That's most likely why a copyist or somebody put it in there to show that Jesus did not judge. He says, I do not judge anyone. But then he says, and even if I should judge, my judgment is valid because I'm not alone. It is I and the Father who sent me. He's now saying he's sent by God the Father, and yet he is God the Son. What the Father wants, the Son wants. 
He's talking about the Trinity here, the first two persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son. Trying to help us understand a mystery about God. And that's difficult. The Trinity is a difficult mystery. It's an act of faith to believe that there are three persons in one God. And yet that act of faith is saying, somehow outside our understanding is this Trinity, this three persons in one God. And Jesus says, even in your law, it is written that the testimony of two can be verified. I testify on my own behalf, and so does the Father who sent me. So they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you neither know me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know the father also. You would understand. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area. But no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. He said to them again, I'm going away and you will look for me, but you will die in your sins. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, he is not going to kill himself, is he? Because he said, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you belong to what is below. I belong to what is above. You belong to this world, but I belong to another world. That is why I told you that you will die in your sins. And if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Jesus is saying, I am. When God appeared before Moses in the burning bush, Moses says to him, who shall I say sent me? And God says, tell them, I am sent you. In John's gospel, Jesus refers to himself as I am, as God. Jesus said to them, what I have told you from the beginning, I have much to say about you in condemnation. The one who sent me is true. And what I heard from him, I tell to the world. Jesus is God's messenger to the world. They did not realize that he was speaking to them of the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am. I'm God, and that I do nothing on my own, but I say only what the Father taught me. Talking about Trinity again, Jesus does what the Father wants because Jesus is the Son of God. It's Jesus' will and the Father's will that is one. And actually, they have a human will and a spiritual will, I mean, a divine will. But the idea when he's saying the Father and I, we think together in a divine way. The one who sent me is with me. So the Father is with me. He doesn't leave me alone because I always do what is pleasing to him. In another section, there'll be where Jesus will say, those who see me see the Father. Because he spoke this way, many came to believe in him. But to those who believe in him, Jesus said, if you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But now their belief is beginning to wane. They say to him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved by anyone. So he's saying, if you believe in me, you believe in the truth. And if you don't believe in me, then you're enslaved in a sense. So they say, we have never been enslaved by anyone. How can you say you will become free? In reality, most of the history of the Israelites, of Hebrew history, they've been enslaved. In reality, they've been free for periods of time. But most of the time, they've been under some kind of foreign domination. Jesus answered them, Amen, amen, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin, is a slave of sin. 
And you know, that's the reality of life. Jesus says, where your treasure is there, will your heart be also. Those who treasure to be sinful, devious, greedy, etc., it guides and it controls their life. It tells them how to live their life. So they're enslaved. A slave does not remain in a household forever. But a son always remains. He's talking about being with God. The slave doesn't remain forever, but the son does. Abraham had two children. He had Ishmael and also he had Isaac. Isaac was the son of his wife. Ishmael was the son of his slave girl or her slave girl, actually Sarah's slave girl. And what happens, once a slave, always a slave. A child of a slave continues to be a slave in Israelite thinking. And so what he's saying is the son is the one who gets the inheritance. It's really Isaac who gets the inheritance from Abraham because he's a real son. And Isaac will pass it on to Jacob. Ishmael will become the father of another nation. But the history of the Hebrew people will follow in that direction. He's a son forever. So a son always remains. So if a son frees you, then you'll truly be free. I know that you are descendants of Abraham. But you're trying to kill me, he says, because my word has no room among you. You're not willing to accept my word. So Jesus knows he's talking to the elders, the Pharisees. They're not going to listen to him. In a sense, people have to be ready to hear what the person is saying. They have to be open to listening and hearing and not be objecting to everything they hear. I tell you what I have seen in the Father's presence. Then do what you have heard from the Father. They answered and said to him, our father is Abraham. So they think Jesus is speaking about his own father, physical father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. So the children always do the works of the father. But now you are trying to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I actually heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You're doing the works of your fathers. So they said to him, we're not illegitimate. We have one father, God. Jesus says to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and am here. I did not come on my own, but God sent me. What you do not understand is what I am saying. Because you cannot bear to hear my word. You belong to your father, the devil. And you willingly carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, the devil. And does not stand in truth. Because there's no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks in character. Because he is a liar and the father of lies. It's characteristic of the devil to tell lies. That's part of his makeup. That's in his character. He tells lies. He's the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. They don't want to hear the truth. The truth is we change their life too much. They don't want to hear the truth. Can any of you cha charge me with sin? If I am telling the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever belongs to God, hears the word of God. For this reason, you do not listen, because you do not belong to God. They answered and said to him, Are we not right in saying you are a Samaritan and are possessed? What they're really saying you're a magician. That's how I saw Samaritans. Any Samaritan who could, could perform miracles, that was magician. And you're possessed. So it's through the power of the devil that these things are done. Jesus answered, I am not possessed. I honor my father, 
but you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the one who judges. Jesus came to earth not for his own glory, but for the glory of God the Father, for the glory of God. Jesus wanted to show us a loving, loving God. And so it happens, he's not here for his own glory. If we look at Jesus' life as presented in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have to say, it wasn't, he wasn't here for his own glory. He was always concerned about others. But he was glorified through his resurrection. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever keeps my word will never see, suffer death. He's not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death. Whoever keeps the word of God will live on in eternity with God. Amen, and I say to you, this is God's word. The Jews said, now we're sure you are possessed. Abraham died, as did the prophets. And you say, whoever keeps my words will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? The reality is the answer is yes. He did not, who died, who, who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is worth nothing. I'm not here to glorify myself. But if it is the Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God. It's going to be shown especially again through the resurrection of Jesus. You do not know the Father, but I know him. And if I should say to you, I do not know him, I would be like you, a liar. But if I do know him and I keep his word, Abraham, your father, rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old yet, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. There it is again, the third time. Jesus saying, I am. I'm God. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid and went out of the temple area. They were going to stone him because he was blaspheming in their mind. He was someone who was claiming to be God. And so in Jewish thinking, they would stone a person who claimed to be God. Chapter 9. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind by birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. This particular man is the one that the works of God will work through. Jesus is going to perform a miracle, but also teach them something. We have to do the works of the one who, is sent, who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus comes into the darkness. John's gospel contrasts light with darkness. So the world is going to be dark, but Jesus is bringing the light. Jesus is the light of the world. What he's really saying here is that the idea of someone suffering, it's not because their parents sinned. It's not even because they sinned. Jesus said, God sends his blessings, his rain, his sunshine on the good and the bad. People live their life. They have a choice of choosing to really believe and love God or to reject God. So after he had talked to them about the blind man, he spat on the ground and made clay with saliva and smeared the clear clay on this man's eyes. In Jesus' day, very often when some of the healers healed others, they would make a little mud, little clay, 
and put it on the person's eye as part of their healing process. And so that was like being the magician. And then Jesus said to the man, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. The word Siloam means sent. The man is being sent. As we read the rest of this, he's sent to be, a, be someone who's an evangelist, to speak about Jesus. So he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar, they said, isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Someone said, it is. But others said, no, no, he just looks like him. So how, was his, so how were his eyes open? He replied, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened the eyes on the Sabbath. It's really not the problem of healing the blind man here. The problem that Jesus has to face is he broke the Sabbath. So the Pharisees asked how the man was able to see, and he told them how. So some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a sinful man do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you have to say about him? since he opened your eyes. He said, he is a prophet. Now the Jewish leadership did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight until they summoned his parents. They asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he see now? His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. We do not know how he sees now, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He can, add, he can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for they had already agreed, the Jews had already agreed, that if anyone acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah, he would be expelled from the synagogue. A terrible thing in those days. For this reason, the parents said, he's of age, ask him. One of the rules that was from for long was sent around within Palestine was that if anybody professed that Jesus was the Messiah, they would be cast out of the synagogue. That rule came into being about the year 90, 85, 90. By that time, the other Gospels were written. By that time, everybody in the story has been deceased probably. But what it's really saying is that the writer, the one who wrote this, the author, is the one who is recalling that there's this law. He doesn't know when it came into being, but he puts it here into his story. The law that they would be cast out of the synagogue. So the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give praise to God. We know that this man is a sinner. The blind man replied, If he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Terrible thing to say to the Pharisees. They ridiculed him and said, you are that man's disciple. You are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses but we do not know where this one is from. The man answered and said, 
This is what is so amazing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if one is devout and does his will, he listens to him. So he's saying that God must listen to Jesus because Jesus does the will of God by opening his eyes. It's unheard of that anyone should open the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could not do anything. They answered and said to him, you were born totally in sin. And are you trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. The idea is that if someone has a physical ailment, ailment, it's a sign they're a sinner. And so they're saying, you were born in sin. Your blindness, they say, really taught us that, showed that. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking to you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshipped him. Then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who might not see and those who do see might become blind. What he's saying is that those who don't see those have true blindness, not spiritual blindness. They're able to see. But then there's others like the Pharisees. They claim they see. They claim they know everything. But actually, they're blind. They'll become blind. He doesn't mean that they're suddenly going to become blind. What he's saying is they're blind all along but don't know it. They're spiritually blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you are saying, We see, so your sin remains. What he's saying there is that if you were physically blind, you would be fine. But now you keep saying, I, I understand, I see, I know. And Jesus is saying, You really don't. You're blind. Chapter 10, the good shepherd. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever does not enter the sheepfold through the gate, but climbs over elsewhere, is a thief and a robber. He's talking here about being the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. It's really looking back at the scriptures, trying to understand the meaning of shepherd in Jewish thinking. In the Old Testament, God sees the kings as the shepherd of the people. He becomes upset with them because they don't shepherd their people well. They're going to be punished because of that. The shepherd, the good shepherd, the one who owned the sheep, very often set up a relationship with the sheep, almost like a father to his children. They really loved them as though they were children, but they recognized still they were animals. To sacrifice their first, their best sheep, really asked a lot of the shepherd. This is what they brought to sacrifice to God. They trusted God. They took their best sheep and they offered it to God, their best child in a sense, although they still recognize it not as a child, but as the symbol, the symbol of a child. So when a shepherd gave up the sheep for sacrifice, he wasn't simply giving up, well, let's take this animal and give it up. It was something that he was concerned about and had a special love for. So Jesus saying here, amen, amen, I say to you, whoever does not enter a sheepfold through the gate, but climbs in elsewhere, is a thief and a robber. He's talking about the Pharisees. He's saying they don't come in through the gate. They don't have that love for the sheep that they should have. They're climbing. They're stealing the sheep. They're taking away the people who really belong to God and leading them in a different, the wrong direction. Whoever enters through the gate 
is the shepherd of the sheep. So the shepherd is the one, he comes through the gate and the sheep, the gatekeeper opens for him and the sheep hears his voice as he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. The shepherd spends so much time with the sheep that the sheep gradually came to know the voice of the shepherd. When the shepherd called out to them, or even gave them names and called them by name, they would come. So the good shepherd, they come to the good shepherd. The good shepherd has a loving concern for his sheep. When he is driven out all his own uh, and he walks ahead of them, the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. But they will not follow a stranger. They will run away from him because they do not recognize the voice of a stranger. Although Jesus used this figure of speech, they did not realize what he was trying to tell them. What he was trying to tell them is that the people will follow the Pharisees, but some of them will rebel. They will say there's something wrong here. They realize there's a difference as they do, for instance, the man born blind, realize there's something wrong. They don't have an answer for him. How could a sinner heal is the blind man's question. The Pharisees, they're trying to steal from Jesus, that man who was born blind but can now see. But Jesus then comes and sees the man and shares the true message with him. He's the shepherd who loves his sheep. So Jesus said to them again, Amen, amen, I say to you, I am the gate for the sheep. So in the first part, he's the good shepherd. Uh, the gatekeeper opens him. Now he becomes the gate. He uses a different image of himself. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, and I will come in and go out and find pasture. So he's the gate. He's the opening. He's the way to God. And so those who go through that gate will find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. One of the famous Psalms in the Old Testament, Psalm 23. My shepherd is the Lord. There is nothing I shall want. It's a Psalm that people in anxiety should read. They should have it before them. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. He leads me behind, beside restful waters. It is a calming part of that psalm that really tells us God is the good shepherd. God leads us to refreshing waters. Goodness and kindness will follow me all the days of my life because of the good shepherd. So a shepherd is an image that is found often through the Old Testament and on into the New Testament. So Jesus is saying, he's the good shepherd. So I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Very often, if the shepherd didn't care for the sheep, he would let the wolf come and kill the sheep, take the sheep, destroy the sheep. But really what he's saying here, he's the good shepherd. The shepherd protects the sheep even at the expense of his life, even at the danger of losing his life. Jesus will lose his life. He's the good shepherd. He dies for us, his sheep. A hired man who is not a shepherd and whose sheep are not his own sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf catches and scatters them. The hireling, the one who isn't the owner of the sheep, or it doesn't have any loving concern for the sheep. Why should I allow myself to be killed? Why should I allow life to become difficult? They run away and they leave the sheep to the wolf. They don't commit themselves to what God wants us to commit ourselves to. They don't commit themselves to caring for the sheep, for other people, for God's people. This is because his work, he works for pay, the hireling. And he has no concern for the sheep. 
He's simply doing it because it gives him some profit. It gives him something good. He's greedy, so he gets more money or whatever. But he gets something for taking care of the sheep. But now when the wolf comes, he runs. I am the good shepherd. I know mine and mine know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I will lay down my life for my sheep. Jesus does lay down his life for his sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. Them also I must lead, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, one shepherd. Some uh, interpreting this say, well, there's some who didn't, didn't accept Jesus. They belong to a different group, Gentiles. They weren't among the Jews. But Jesus is saying, they'll hear my voice. They'll join us. They'll be one flock. Even today we have to say, if you're working for God, we're still in one flock. We're working for Christ. No one takes it from me. I lay down my life, but no one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own. And so he's saying that he offers up himself for others. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. This command I have received from my father. When Jesus is before Pilate, Pilate says to Jesus, don't you know I can put you to death? And Jesus can say, if I wanted, God would send me a legion. Save me from this moment. He has the power to be saved from that moment. But of course, as we know what Jesus says, not my will, God, but yours be done. Again, there was a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he is possessed and out of his mind. Why do we listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one possessed. Surely a demon cannot open the eyes of a blind man. Can he? The feast of the dedication was then taking place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple area on the portico of Solomon. The Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my father's name, they testify to me. But you do not believe. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. So unlike the other sheep, the sheep of Jesus, the shepherd, will live forever, eternal life. No one can take them out of my hand, on into eternity. My Father has, who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. That's the essence of the Trinity. The Father and I are one. And so Jesus is saying, he's God. The Jews again picked up rocks to stone him. He's saying, he's God. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from my father. For which of these are you trying to stone me? They answered him, we're not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. You, a man, are making yourself God. Jesus answered, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If it calls them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, we have to follow scripture. Can you say that the one whom the father has consecrated and sent into the world blasphemes because I say, I am the son of God. He's playing with them in a way. A little bit of semantics here. There's a part in the Old Testament where those who are chosen to judge the people. They're chosen to judge the people and they call them gods. Moses calls them gods. Others call them gods. If I do not perform my father's work, do you not believe in me? So nobody gets upset because they're called gods. Why are you upset? Because I'm called a god. So now he's not leaning on the idea he's the son of God. 
What do you say I'm calling myself a God like they call themselves God? But if I perform even the, the works, even if you do not believe me, believe in the works so that you may realize and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. John's Gospel, the unity of the Father and the Son. They tried to arrest him again, but he escaped from their power. He went back across the Jordan to the place where John first baptized, and there he remained. Many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but everything John said about this man was true. And many then began to believe in him. John the Baptist didn't perform any miracles, but everything he said about Jesus was true. Chapter 11. Now a man was ill, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. John jumps a little bit ahead here. Actually, that's something that didn't happen yet in John's gospel. It'll happen a little later on in another chapter. But right now he's saying, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. We've heard about Mary and Martha before. It was her brother, Mary's brother, Lazarus, who was ill. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified with it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. The idea is that we see Jesus really close to that family. We see where Jesus is visiting with Martha and Mary at one point. Now, Lazarus, their brother, is mentioned. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. The disciples said, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you, and you want to go back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Jesus still has a ministry to perform. And the light is bringing him in that direction to raise Lazarus. He said to them and told them, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I am going to awaken him. The disciples said, Master, if he is asleep, he will be saved. They say, someone who is asleep, he's not dying. But Jesus was talking about his death, while they thought that he meant ordinary sleep. So then Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus has died. And I am glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas, called Didymus, means the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go and die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. He's significantly and truly dead. He was in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany, it was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away. This is significant because the word about Lazarus being raised from the dead traveled to Jerusalem. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. It's almost as though she doesn't know what she's asking for. She's saying, whatever you ask of God, is she right? asking for resurrection? It's not clear. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I will know, I know he will rise 
in the resurrection on the last day. Again, into John's gospel, a message, a theological message. There is a resurrection. He will rise again. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Talks about eternal life, resurrection. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Eternal life. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. In John's Gospel, Martha is the one who makes the profession of faith that Peter makes in the other Gospels. So Martha now becomes a significant person. She proclaims that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary. The teacher is here and is asking for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she rose quickly and went to Jesus. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met him. So when the Jews who were with Mary in her house, comforting her, saw her get up quickly and go out, they followed her, presuming that she was going to the tomb. They used to have professional weepers people who came and would weep, and they would follow the person, uh, a relative of the person who died. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet and said, just as Martha did, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, where have you laid him? Jesus is upset. They said to him, sir, come and see. Come to the tomb. Visit his gravesite. See how he loved him when they saw Jesus being perturbed. Some of them said, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? The emphasis is on the death of Lazarus. So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone rolled across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. Jesus is thanking God for performing this miracle at his call. He knows God will do it. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he, Jesus had done began to believe in him. That's the last we hear of Lazarus, but now we talk about the aftermath. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and said, what are we going to do? This man is performing many signs. They refused to look at the value of the signs. They are more interested in keeping Jesus from becoming so popular and listening to his message. If we leave him alone, all will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our land and our nation. They were afraid of a Roman invasion if they didn't do something about Jesus. The reality is, even though they did something, put him to death, in the year 70, the Romans still came and destroyed their city. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing, nor do you consider that it is better for you that one man should die 
instead of the people, so that the whole nation may not perish. He didn't realize he was prophesying. He was saying, one man should die. Jesus died so that all the people, the whole nation will not perish, so that the rest of the world will not perish, will be freed from our sins. According to this, it sounds like it's expedient that Jesus should die in the sense that he gives himself freely, gives his life. It's not the father saying, well, if he dies, everything's fine. No, that's not the idea. The idea Jesus is saying, I offer myself. I'm the sheep of sacrifice. So Caiaphas did not say this on his own. But since he was high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not only for the nation, but also to gather into one the dispersed children of God. The dispersed children of God are all nations. It means they're dispersed throughout the world. At one time, it meant mainly the Jews who were dispersed. But John here is referring to all people. So from that day on, the leaders planned to kill Jesus. So Jesus no longer walked about in public among the Jews. But he left for the region near the desert to a town called Ephraim, where he remained with his disciples. He went into hiding for a while. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before Passover to purify themselves. They looked for Jesus and said to one another, as they were in the temple area, What do you think? That he will come for the feast? For the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should inform them so that they might arrest him. Everything is coming to a boiling point. Everything is building up now, getting very, very close. And so what happens is that Jesus now is being prepared for his passion. Chapter 12. Six days after Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. So Passover is now a week before this, where Lazarus was. Lazarus was at Bethany. They gave a dinner for him, and Martha served. And Lazarus was one of those reclining at table with him. Mary took a litter of costly perfumed oil made from genuine aromatic nard and anointed the feet of Jesus. So in the previous chapter, talked about Mary was the one who anointed Jesus' feet with expensive oil. She dried them with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then Judas the Iscariot, one of his disciples, and the one who would betray him, said, why was this not sold for 300 days wages and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and held the money bag and used to steal from the contributions. It's setting the scene for Judas, who really is a slave to sin in the sense, a slave to making more money and he, stealing. So Jesus said, leave her alone. Let her keep this for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. That could sound selfish, except to realize Jewish thinking. Jewish thinking is it's more important to prepare the, poor, the, de the dead, to take care of the dead, to give them a proper burial. That's more important even than giving money to the poor. They saw that as a primary end. Story in Tobit. Tobit's ready to sit down to a nice meal. And someone comes and tells him that there's a body of one of the Israelites in the streets. He leaves that nice, wonderful meal immediately, doesn't touch it, and runs out because it's important to bury those who are deceased. So now a large crowd of the Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, who was a table. Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And the chief priest plotted to kill Lazarus too, because many of the Jews were turning away and believing in Jesus because of him. 
So they were believing in Jesus because Lazarus was sitting there at table. As we read the scriptures, we find out that there are in the scriptures seven signs. And the seven signs, as we see, that Lazarus is the seventh sign. Lazarus is raised from the dead. And so as we go through the scriptures, we learn about the seven signs, but we also learn about Lazarus. Lazarus is the last of Jesus' miracles. And so what happens now is that Jesus will now begin his passion. So next week as we continue to talk about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and where Jesus' hour has now come. And so Jesus is now preparing for his death. May the light of Christ lead me. The power of Christ be with me. The wisdom of Christ inspire me. The word of Christ instruct me. The shelter of Christ protect me. The hand of Christ hold me. The love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me. The sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.